Welcome back to Global Spiritual Revolution Radar here with your host and moderator this evening, Bishop Larry Gators. You can call us in right now if you are located within the continental United States of America at 929-477-3997. Again, beloved, that is 929-477-3997. Now, if you live outside of the continental United States of America, you can call us in right now at 1, then 929 929- Four seven seven three nine nine seven. Again, beloved, that is one. Then nine two nine four seven seven three nine nine seven. If you want to send any of your questions tonight for our guests, you can do so right now and during and throughout the broadcast on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio at yahoo.com. Again, beloved, Global Spiritual Revolution Radio at yahoo.com. You can listen to us each and every Sunday morning at ten a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Talk America, on the Talk America Radio Network, including the Red Nation Rising Radio Network, both on www.talkamericaradio.us forward slash Global Spiritual Revolution Radio or Red Nation Rising Radio.us forward slash Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. And let me um, just um, reveal those two links again. Uh, that is talkamericaradio.us forward slash global spiritual revolution radio and red nation rising radio uh, dot us forward slash global spiritual revolution radio. Now, both Talk America Radio and Red Nation Rising Radio are the new dominant forces in conservative talk radio. I am so very excited tonight, amen. We have a lot of people listening online throughout the world, amen. Normally, we get uh, our regular spiritual clientele uh, of listening, of listeners throughout the world in 150 countries, but now um, that has grown up to around 176 countries, 177 countries now, with the inclusion of um, Brussels, Belgium. We got brand new Global Spiritual Revolution partners listening out of Brussels, Belgium right now. And I am so very honored tonight um, to have with us for the, for the very first time on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio, uh, world-renowned. To me, he's a hero. Not just here in the United States, but this man, who is a great man of God, is a hero to millions of people around the world. Amen. Uh, And I present to some and and introduce to others for the very first time here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio through Global Spiritual Revolution Media out of Long Island, New York, the Honorable Dr. Victor uh, DeNoble, Ph.D. He is the former scientist uh, with the... um, He was with the Philip Morris Research Center many years ago, and uh, he was the very first one, the very first whistleblower to expose the inner corruption of not just the Philip Morris uh, Corporation, but many of your major tobacco industries here in the United States and around the world. And back in 2011, uh, he uh, produced and created uh, what I call one of the most powerful documentaries uh, in, uh, in the United States of America and around the world, and that is Addiction Incorporated Inside the Darkness. Again, in, uh, Addiction Incorporated Inside the Darkness, and um, I just, I'm just so excited tonight to have this great man of God, a great man, uh, and a man of authenticity and a man of truth, and that is Dr. Victor uh, DeNobo. Dr. DeNobo, thank you so much, sir, for taking the time out oh. of your very busy schedule to be with us here tonight on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. Oh, thank you, Bishop Gators, for having me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you guys. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Addiction Incorporated Inside uh, the Darkness. Before we get into um, the meat of this powerful documentary, and to all of our Global Spiritual Revolution partners, you can go onto his website right now. Uh, at victordenoble.com, that is victordenoble.com, that is V-I-C-T-O-R-D-E-N-O-B-L-E, victordenoble.com. You can also go on um, the powerful website of addictionincorporated.com. Again, beloved, addictionincorporated.com, and you can purchase this DVD uh, tonight, right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, uh, Dr. Victor, thank you so much, sir. Um, I've been looking forward to this this interview for many weeks now. Tell us, uh, 
you know, we all know you, but for uh, a lot of our listening audience uh, who are pastors and bishops um, and seminary presidents all over the world, can you just give us a, a quick synopsis of your background um, and how you came in contact with the Philip Morris Research Center and what prompted you uh, to uh, not only expose Philip Morris and the tobacco industry, but also um, to create a powerful documentary uh, of Addiction Incorporated. Yes. Well, obviously, my name is Victor De Noble. I'm named after my father, of course. And uh, I, I, in 1979, the, the uh, tobacco company Philip Morris, they approached me. I'm a scientist, and I was doing a postdoc fellowship, and I was studying drug addiction. And they came to me and they said, hey, you know, uh, we're killing a lot of people. And they said, yeah, they said nicotine causes heart attacks, and uh, we really don't think that's a good idea. And I'm going, wow, this is really cool. And they said, can you help us create a tobacco product that, that has a nicotine substitute that people will want to use, but it wouldn't cause heart attacks and brain stroke? Mm. Here I am, I'm, you know, I'm this young scientist going, you know, gee, I, I really wouldn't mind changing a couple of lives here. Um, and this company is saying, yeah, we want, to help, we want to help you to do that. So, boom, you know, I, I joined the company. And, uh, and the goal of our research was to actually find a substitute for nicotine, a, a drug that would, uh, people would want to use, tobacco, smoke it, and it would be, still be addicting, but it wouldn't yeah. cause the cardiovascular risk. That, so that, that's kind of the background of that. Um, and, of course, that didn't work out as, as I thought it was going to work out. And many, many years later, we testified before Congress, we meaning my associate, Dr. Paul Mealy and I, and um, a producer named Charlie Evans came and said, uh, and this was in 1995, he said, I'm going to make a documentary about you. And I said, oh, really? That's nice. Well, <laughs> when? He said, well, about 10 years from now. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> he said, oh, yeah. He said, right now, he said, you're a flash in the pan. You're in before Congress. He said, he said but you haven't done anything yet. He said, right. if what you're doing now in 1994 changes public policy, policy mm -hmm. if it helps people, if it changes laws, then 10 years from now, we'll tell people about it. A mm -hmm. And that's how the documentary came about. Wow. Um, I'm telling you, Addiction Incorporated, Take us from, um, from birth to conception, uh, from conception to birth to life, as far as the creativity of this powerful documentary. Why, is it so imp why was it so important, uh, Dr. DeNovo, to create uh, such a powerful, insightful documentary in Addiction Incorporated? And so just kind of matriculate us, walk us through from conception to birth, uh, to what it is right now in a capsule. What is Addiction Incorporated? It's, it's the story uh, of a, a scientist who wanted to help people and mm. went to a corporation to do that, and the corporation you know, basically said, no, we're not going to do that because we're going to lose money. So he mm. didn't have uh, you know, this time span of, we want to help people as long as it doesn't cost us any money. Right. And, of course, it's going to cost them a ton of money. Uh, so the corporation okay. fires you, you fires the scientist, which is me and, and my friend Paul. And, but we're silenced by a secrecy agreement, and we're silenced for 10 years. And all of a mm. sudden, through the document, you see the science of what we discovered and how we hid it from the company. And we didn't tell them everything we were doing. But we told them nothing we were doing. And it was mm. because our laboratory was very secret. You know, you, you couldn't see through the windows. All the windows were covered up. All the doors were locked. And so Paul and I were doing these crazy experiments that they never wanted us to do. So the documentary kind of, kind of captures that. And it captures the firing. And then it captures the 10 years of silence and how mm. the tobacco industry followed us. And they, they recorded what we do. They followed our jobs. Okay. Um, and then, then, of course, the, we were released by our, from our secrecy agreement by a congressional hearing. And, mm -hmm. and the, the, the documentary covers that and ca captures sort of the, the exposure for the first time ever, the tobacco industry. We all knew they were lying. We, we knew right. they were covering up. But we had no data. We had no scientific proof. But what mm -hmm. Paul and I did back in the 80s was the scientific proof. 
Mm-hmm. So here you, in the documentary, you see the scientific proof being exposed in Congress. And then, of course, the tobacco industry says, wait a minute, you we're in trouble, so we need to turn back to Congress and ask them, hey, right. help us. And, and you see there the, the tobacco industry's kind of efforts to manipulate Congress, to say, hey, we're going to give you a lot of yeah. money in mm. order to do, kill people. That kind of thing. Um, and, and you can see that through, through the documentary. And, of course, in the end, uh, you see the tobacco industry uh, not losing. I wouldn't say they lost. I would say they settled. They mm. settled for regulation. They settled for giving money to the government. Uh, they settled for President Barack Obama signing, you know, the, the, the Smoking and Health Act. Um, but they, they, they didn't lose. They, they mm. use their power and their manipulation to craft a settlement that allows them to continue to use their products. This this is amazing. I, I read something uh, recently today, Dr. De, uh, DeNoble, and we have with us uh, Dr. Victor DeNoble, world-renowned scientist. Uh, to me, uh, uh, man of God, you're one of the greatest heroes in this nation's history. And I am not exaggerating because – this is a not just a global epidemic. Uh, this is a global consortium, a global conspiracy. Am I correct in saying that, sir? Well, let's put it this way. Six million people, let me repeat that, six million people will die this year from tobacco products worldwide. Wow. That's, that's an enormous an enormous number hmm. of people who are, who are losing their lives. And, and the insidious thing, is that the tobacco industry, their clientele starts using the product by the age of 12. Mm. So it's not that you have 21-year-old people saying, hey, I think I ought to smoke a cigarette. You have 12-year-olds who, who may, do not possess the, the, the foresight to say, what I'm doing now is going to affect me 30 years from now. So the tobacco mm. industry has targeted its young population so, yeah, I, 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 it is worldwide. It's a worldwide epidemic. Well, I, I also read today, and we have with us Dr. Victor, uh, Victor DeNoble, former scientist uh, for the world-renowned Philip Morris Research Center here in, in the United States of America, was also the very first one uh, to whistleblow uh, on the tobacco industry here in the United States. And I believe you appeared before Congress in 1994. Am I correct in saying that, sir? That's correct. Uh, April 28th, 1994. Wow. And two I, I read after, something. Two, two weeks after. I'm sorry. Wow. That's powerful. And I read something recently, uh, a, a very telling stat uh, from, from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. It, you know, it's not called the Center for Disease Eradication, but control. That's interesting. <laughs> that. Uh, five million smoker, uh, smokers, five million, this is telling, smokers die, they die worldwide each year. Uh, so they're saying five million people who smoke die worldwide each year, which is the equivalent of 30 seven, uh, 747 jets crashing every day. That's amazing. Five million people. Yes. Uh, who smoke die worldwide each year, which is the mathematical equivalent of 3747 jets crashing every day. 13,000 smokers die every single day. And this is really, and this is from the CDC, uh, Dr. DeNoble, and this is really telling as we're talking about Addiction Incorporated that 100 million smokers died in the 20th century alone. One one hundred million wow smokers died in the twentieth century alone. Uh, and if this is not uh, corrected, according to the CDC, uh, another billion will die in the twenty first century. Um, when did this conspiracy begin? Uh, um, I read somewhere it it might have started here in New York City uh, in nineteen going back I believe December fifteenth nineteen fifty three uh, of a meeting of some of the uh, largest American tobacco companies here in the United States. Uh, I believe it, it took place uh, here in New York City at, at the Plaza Hotel. 
where many senior executives of these tobacco companies, including a man by the name of John Hill, who was the um, a member of the P, he's, uh, was the director of his own PR firm, Hill in Norton, and they're saying that there there was a global cabal, a conspiracy uh, between the t- tobacco giants. All right, uh, and they were in collusion with a lot of political leaders on uh, Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., and a lot of lobbyists, uh, including the media, to try to perpetuate this lie that um, cigarettes are not harmful. Um, uh, uh, you may even go deep into this, man of God. Uh, where, uh, why did this conspiracy begin, uh, number one? And two, is it, is it ongoing right now? It, you're right. It began around 1952-53. In 1952, a scientist first uh, proved that there was a link between tar, which is, the, you know, in tobacco smoke is tar, and, and cancer. And the tobacco industry, they met, you're right, in a hotel in New York. Uh, and the seven executives said, look, you know, we, we have to de- not only deny this, we have to disprove it. So we've got right. to... We've got to have a public relations firm help us with this. And we have mm. to discredit any scientist who right. says tobacco smoke is going to be bad for you. And, and they mm-hmm. had this massive public relations uh, firm put together, and uh, 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 Noel, Noel, and I think Noel and somebody, I forget the name of it. Um, and the, and they, they basically said, here's what we'll do. Right. Here's, the, here's the pitch. We're going to say tobacco doesn't cause cancer because nobody has cancer. And in <laughs> 1953, it, that was a true statement because cancer takes, of course, you know, 20 to 30 years to really manifest itself. And in 1953, we weren't, we weren't seeing a lot of cancer from tobacco. So the logic was, let's tell people it doesn't cause cancer mm. because nobody has cancer. And therefore, all the medical community, community is focused. Mm. The next thing they did, they, they actually hired scientists at universities around the world. And they mm-hmm. said, we want you to conduct research that debunks this research. And in wow. science, all you need to do is cast a shadow. You don't have to say they're wrong. We just say, is, well, my research says they're not quite <laughs> correct. Right. And it's that, it's that element of, of, of your, your, it's not accurate. You have conflicting data. And we as human beings, we want to believe things that that are, if we're doing something, we want to believe it's not harmful for us. So they were playing on the emotions of the, of the population to say, hey, you know, I'm smoking, but you know, this scientist says it causes cancer, but he's got the tobacco industry has five people that say it doesn't cause cancer. They must be right. <laughs> right. So it was, it, was a, it was a tremendous, and the campaign continues today. Wow. Um, the tobacco industry says today, uh, oh, by the way, you know, we were wrong. It really does mm. cause cancer, but it's a personal choice, so uh, you gave it to yourself, and we forgot oh to God. tell you about it. Wow. wow. This is amazing, and this is amazing. I have a, um, a to our audience, I, I'm so excited and so very honored to have uh, this great man of God, and to me, your hero, uh, Dr. DeNoble, not just to a lot of, uh, not just to here, uh, to the citizens of this great country, uh, but also to a lot of people around the world, and that is the Honorable Dr. Victor DeNoble, Ph.D., former scientist uh, for the world-renowned Philip Morris Research Center here in the United States of America. Uh, we are discussing his 2011 documentary entitled Addiction Incorporated, Inside the Darkness, as we are exposing the tobacco industry here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. Um, I believe um, the late attorney Robert Blakely, uh, I believe in 1967, uh, had, uh, along with, um, uh, with a, a, um, a group of, of attorneys in 1967, had created the RICO Act uh, to prosecute the uh, a lot of the tobacco um, heads, uh, a lot of the CEOs and the senior executives of these tobacco companies, and we know RICO goes back to what the 1930s and 40s, uh, con- um, you know, 
it was targeted toward the mob, to, to the mafia. And, my, and which brings me to my next question. Uh, do you agree, uh, agree with uh, attorney with the late attorney Robert Blakely that the um, this this system, this global cabal, um, we're talking about the Philip Morris Company, um, we're talking about the British American t- Tobacco Company, um, the Imperial Tobacco Company in in the UK, and the Japan uh, Tobacco Company. Um, and also the uh, the Galois uh, Tobacco Company in France. Do you believe, uh, Doctor Victor, that this was a cabal, a a, um, a mafia type of system? Because it, it, you know these guys seem like they're racketeers. Uh, am, am I correct in saying that, sir? Yes, you are totally. In fact, the, the Department of Justice, uh, United States, uh, sued sued the tobacco industry. Uh, based on the RICO Act, uh, you know, saying that they were racketeers. Uh-huh. And just, ju- uh, the Judge Kessler uh, issued a, a, a withering um, tirade about the tobacco industry, how they have deceived the public. They've, uh, they've lied about the addi- addiction to nicotine. They have increased, mm. they've tried to play the level of nicotine. They've increased the addictiveness of tobacco products. They've deceived the public on light cigarettes. Um, so they have been adjudicated as racketeers, and they are in 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 the in the books as the mob. They they are in there with the mafia. Really? Um, wow. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That 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 adjudication came down. Now the bad news is that the DOJ can't find them. They can't sue them. They can't take money from them. But they can adjudicate them as racketeers. So they have actually been adjudicated as a racketeer racketeering organization in the United States. Wow, and, and, and this this is we're talking not just billions of dollars here in the United States. Are we talking trillions of dollars globally? Is this a trillion dollar? The estimate, oh, the estimates are that uh, it's a billion a billion dollar a day industry. Oh my! Wow! Oh my God! A billion, I didn't in, in fact, I'll give you a little a little kind of quip. It. Uh, one Great. tobacco lawyer uh, who I, I I probably shouldn't name. He worked for Philip Morris. And yes. his retainer was a million dollars a month. Oh, wow. He was paid a million dollars a month to defend the tobacco industry's rights to sell mm-hmm. a product that you know mm-hmm. hurts people, causes death, and causes destruction. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, my God. This, this, is, this is mind-blowing. Repeat that again to our audience, those, those, those financial numbers again, because this is mind-blowing. Yeah, I'm not talking about a law firm. I'm talking about one single lawyer. One, one sing- lawyer in a law firm. One single lawyer was paid a million dollars a month to defend the tobacco industry's rights to sell their product. And that was, that was just one lawyer in one firm. I don't know what the firm was paid, but his salary was a million dollars a month. Oh, my goodness. That. This, this is amazing. We have with this Dr. Victor De, De Noble. Uh, man, of God, you're teaching me things I never knew. Uh, former scientist of the world-renowned Philip Morris Research Center. I believe um, they were bought out or they merged with a company called Altria. Am I correct in saying that, sir? Well, you know, what they did was they changed their name because after the congressional hearing <laughs> from 94, they in 19, in 19, in 99, they said, look, we can't be Philip Morris anymore because everybody hates us. So let's, let's change our name <laughs> to something that sounds honorable. We'll call it Altria, like it, the honorable one. <laughs> So they didn't. They didn't really merge. They just changed their name, and and everybody thought, oh gosh, this is a different company. Wow, this this, this is amazing. I'm a uh, million dollars a month just for one one attorney. Wow, Th- this is powerful. We have with us Dr. Uh, Victor Donova, PhD, former scientist uh, with the world renowned Philip Morris Research Center here in the in the United States of America. Uh, we are discussing his powerful documentary that you can purchase uh, online uh, on addictionincorporated.com, addictionincorporated.com, Inside the Darkness. And I believe uh, part of the, uh, that racketeering cabal uh, was the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company as well. Uh, my, my next question, uh, Doctor, we're, we're talking about addiction. Um, yeah. You know, as we delve inside uh, the darkness, let's talk about Marlboro. <laughs> um, yeah. I, 
it was said that they used to, I don't know if they still do, do this now, that they put ammonia within their cigarettes. Do they still do that now? And what is ammonia, what is that used for today? Well, uh, ammonia is used as an extraction uh, agent. It extracts nicotine from the tobacco so you can process tobacco and then you, you spray the, the, the nicotine back on. Uh, the ammonia uh, wasn't really the big problem. The big problem was something Paul and I discovered in 1982. We found a second drug in tobacco that was addicting. And that, and that molecule, a chemical is called acetaldehyde. It's a very kind of strange chemical. I'll say it again, acetaldehyde. Wow. And what we discovered was this chemical, which goes into your brain with nicotine, actually hmm. changes in your brain to a molecule that's an addictive drug that looks like cocaine. Hmm. So we had discovered this second molecule. And the, it's Philip Morris, the tobacco industry, Altria said, hey, look, you know, you know, this is really cool. Can you tell us if your rats, because we work with rats, if your rats like a lot of nicotine or little nicotine or a lot of, of acetaldehyde, little So we conducted these experiments that said uh, the rats tended to like a little more acetaldehyde than nicotine. That's mm. But the Marlboro cigarette had more nicotine. It was reversed. Hmm. So in 1983, uh-huh. and we know this from Brown and Williamson because they evaluated Marlboro cigarettes. Right. In 1983, the tobacco company added sugar to the Marlboro cigarette. And, and because when uh-huh. you burn sugar, you made hmm. acid aldehyde. They actually made uh-huh. the cigarette more addictive. And that's what was, was proven in, in the, in the uh, DOJ case. That's what Dutch Kessel was saying. They actually made the Marlboro cigarette more addicting by putting in a mm-hmm. chemical like sugar so right. that more people would use the Marlboro cigarette. It was amazing. Wow. And so this increased the nicotine uptake and the addiction. Am I correct in saying that? Exactly right. Wow. Yeah. This is this is this is mind blowing. You got to come back for a part two and three. This, I'm telling you, uh, we have a lot of. Um, we got several thousand emails coming in tonight. Amen. We may get to a, a few of them um, before the broadcast is, is is out tonight. We have with this world renowned scientist. Amen. To me, he is an American hero. Amen. There should be a Hollywood movie about our guest, Dr. Victor DeNovo, Ph.D former scientist for the world-renowned Philip Morris Research Center here in the United States of America. We are discussing his 2011 documentary entitled Addiction Incorporated Inside the Darkness. Amen. Here and only here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. Uh, This this is amazing. This is amazing. I I believe in, again, in 1983, Correct me if I'm wrong, doctor, and we're talking about Addiction Incorporated tonight. Philip Morris, in 1983, applied pressure on the pharmaceutical uh, companies here in the United States to, to restrict access to Nicorette products. And, and to our revolution partners, let me say this again, because this is demonic. In 1983, uh, Philip Morris applied pressure on the pharmaceutical industry here in the United States to restrict access to Nicorette um, products for 10 years. So, and Philip Morris said in a statement in 1983 uh, that uh, suspending our purchases uh, due to the, notice this, the offensive nature of Nicorette. We're not talking about cigarettes. We're talking about a, a patch that could help them help a person wean themselves off of the cigarette, uh, off of the, the addiction. But the, but the William Morris Corporation is saying that the Nicorette uh, is offensive in nature. Uh, what's your take on it? This is amazing. You know, it's interesting. In the beginning, when, when the, the nicotine uh, replacement therapy came out, the tobacco industry was, you're right, they, they were very worried and they were putting pressure on the pharmaceutical companies. And, and that lasted for a few years. And then it changed. Mm-hmm. And mm. how it changed, how it changed was all of a sudden later on in, in the years, the tobacco industry realized, wait a minute, these right. people are selling the Nicorette gum and patches 
and they're giving these people the same drug that we're addicting them to. Oh. And all of a sudden, the tobacco industry backed away. They said, wait a minute. Let's allow them to sell this because these people who want to quit, they're not smoking, but they're still addicted to our drug. And, they, mm. and, the tobacco said, and they're going to come back to us. And it was a really phenomenal, it was an interesting phenomenon because in the beginning, you, the tobacco industry was so worried that tobacco patches and inhalers and all things. And at the right. end, after a few years, they said, wait a minute, hey, you're giving these people the same drug that I'm trying to sell them. <laughs> so, so the tobacco industry actually reversed their course uh, later on and said, no, we're not, we're going to let people sell this stuff and we're going to want people on patches because having a patch in your arm isn't the same thing as smoking a cigarette. There's, there's a major difference. So the tobacco industry began saying, okay, you want to keep these people addicted to our drug, we're going to help you. See, it's really a, wow. an amazing twist. Of speech. So we go from the cigar to the cigarette to the patch, and now we've got this, this uh, vapor cigarette called e-cigarette. Um, it, it seems Correct. like constantly the, um, the American tobacco industrial complex is trying to create ways and avenues to addict America. Am I correct in saying that, sir? No question about it. The electronic cigarette is actually designed to keep your brain addicted to a nicotine. That, that's, wow. that's all it's designed to do. Uh, you know, the problem is we don't hmm. find people using the electronic cigarette for quitting. We find them saying, oh, I'm using my electronic cigarette because I can't smoke here. So I uh. use this to get myself my nicotine. What we're seeing is that in, in, we're seeing a huge increase and electronic yeah. cigarette use in, ele- ready for this, elementary and middle school kids. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my God. Elementary and middle school kids. And what we mm. now know is that ele- middle school kids who are using electronic cigarettes are six times more likely to use tobacco products when they get to high school. That, that's, Just, so that's the addiction. What, what's e- mm. equally sinister is when you have an electronic cigarette, you have a, a, a chamber which has liquid in it, and that liquid's flavored. You know, we all want to smoke peach and, you know, mm-hmm. you know strawberry, <laughs> nicotine. We don't really care. That's right. designed for kids. But when you have yes. a coil in there and that coil heats up that liquid, that coil emits particles. So what mm. we're seeing in electronic cigarettes is almost the same chemicals we see in a tobacco product. We see acetaldehyde, formaldehyde. We see uh, all, you know, all sorts of the chemicals that you see when you burn tobacco comes mm. from heating up the liquid with, with, a, cha- with a coil. Oh, okay. So wow. Really dangerous. This is powerful. And we have with us Dr. Victor DeNoble, um, PhD. My mouth was wide open here, man of God. Uh, here in the studios uh, in Long Island, New York, we have with us again Dr. Victor, Victor DeNoble, uh, to me, an American hero, a, a global hero. And I, I believe one day there's going to be a director, whether it's Oliver Stone uh, or somebody else, you know, that, that um, uh, Steven Spielberg, that will make a, a major film about you, man of God, because you are a true hero in every sense of the world. Former scientist for the world-renowned Philip Morris Research Center, uh, and also the creator of the 2011 documentary, um, Addiction Incorporated. Wow, that's powerful. Inside the Darkness, only here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. Um, I I read another stat from the CDC that in 2014, uh, tobacco companies spent more than $9 billion dollars marketing cigarettes and smokeless tobacco in the United States, $9 billion in uh, PR marketing. Uh, This amount uh, translates to nearly $25 million each day or $1 million each hour or every hour. Uh, Which brings me to my next question, uh, man of God. Um, I I got a pastor friend, a bishop friend um, in Nigeria had told me um, recently, and as as I was preparing for you tonight, that um, many of the Western tobacco companies are targeting many African nations. And and now you've got gangs in throughout Niger, Nigeria, throughout 
the continent of Africa um, that are not only selling <laughs> Marlboro uh, clothing for babies, Mar- and, and, and not just Marlboro, but uh, many other uh, cigarettes, um, the names of uh, actual cigarettes uh, that we see in America today, Marlboro is not only uh, selling cigarettes on the black market in Africa, but they're selling children's uh, bay. I mean, they're selling children's clothing, infant clothing, which says the word Marlboro. If this is crazy, or Philip Morris, and I believe there's a cigarette called Visa. Uh, so, which brings me to my next question. Uh, does this black marketing of, of cigarettes, as far as um, companies targeting uh, Africa, is, does this still go on today, or has our government put a stop to this? Well, uh, let me address uh, developing nations. You know, the tobacco industry knows that a lot of the world is still developing. The United States, we're very fortunate. Our country has developed economically. And a lot, of the, a lot of nations around the world, Asia and Africa, are still developing, and they're still looking for ways to enhance their economy. And the tobacco mm. industry knows that if they go to a developing country and say, hey, you know, if you sell our product here, we're going to give you 50 cents of every dollar we earn. Uh-huh. And, and you know, you're going, oh, my gosh, you know, what can I do with that money? I can build roads. I can build schools. <laughs> so right. they, 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 they prey on the developing countries in a way – that's so insidious. They hold out the carrot and say, we'll let you develop your country if you let us kill your people. And that's the part that oh. they don't say. Mm. You think about it in that way. What they're saying is, we'll give you money if you let us kill your people. And because mm. we know, the tobacco industry knows, that a person who starts smoking is going to smoke for about 40 years of their life. I'm through addicted. Mm. And in those 40 years, they're going to reap a whole bunch of money. So that's, that's still going on all over the world, especially in, 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 in countries that are still developing and still maturing. Now, as far wow. as the United States goes, um, yeah. they, they, they completed that, uh, that targeting uh, right. back in the late, after World War II. Now, most people don't realize this, but in the beginning of World War II, and these are not exact numbers, okay? I'm going to give you some, some estimates. In the beginning of World War yeah. II, about 26 to 28% of, of white Americans smoked. At the beginning of World War II, only about 10% of African Americans smoked. So there's a big difference. Hmm. Now, you had the World War II, and at the end of World War II, you had 26% of white Americans going up to almost 40%. And hmm. in the African American troops, it stayed at about 10, 11, or 12%. And kids ask me why. And, I, and hmm. they don't understand this because in World War II, we had a segregated army. And they look at me like, what? Uh, oh, yeah, you had a segregated army. You had uh, white troops and black troops. And right. you, know what the, you know what the tobacco industry didn't give the African-American troops who fought alongside of our troops? They didn't give them cigarettes in the K-Rush. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So at the end of World War II, these tobacco executives got together and said, wait a minute, we made a mistake. We, we, mm-hmm. didn't, we didn't evict all these soldiers who are fighting for our country, who happen to be non-white. So you know what we're going to mm. do? We're going to get their own cigarette. And you know what the tobacco industry did? They invented menthol cigarettes. Hmm. 90% of all the menthol cigarettes in this country are purchased by African Americans because they advertise menthol only in African American communities. So mm. that, that's, how they, that's how they manipulated our country. Now, today they don't have oh, to do that because the addiction is the addiction. But that's what's going on all over the world. What is menthol? What, what, what is that, uh, uh, Dr. DeNovo? Why, uh, why, why was the African-American – well, first of all, what is menthol? And number two, why was it specifically targeted to the black community? Okay. Well, you remember when you used to get a cold back in the old day and your mom would rub that big Vicks vapor rub on your chest? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, that sir. would be menthol, and that, that opens up your lungs. It's, it's a bronchodilator. Now, mm. here, here's interesting. The tobacco industry didn't advertise menthol because they knew what it did. They said, we've got to do something different for that community, and somebody said, hey, menthol kind of smells good. Mm. So, and, that's, and so it was, a, it was a naive 
uh, in terms – they targeted the community, but they didn't know what they were doing. What they were doing was mm-hmm. if you smoke a menthol cigarette, menthol opens up your lungs because it's a bronchodilator. Mm-hmm. That means you can, you can inhale smoke more deeply into your lungs. And if you, oh. inhale, you inhale smoke more deeply, you have a higher risk of getting cancer. So if you oh. look in the African-American community, huh. they have a higher risk of cancer of smoking menthol cigarettes than people who don't smoke menthol cigarettes. It doesn't matter if you're African-American or not. Hmm. If, a, if a white guy smoking, a purple guy smoking menthol cigarettes, they are <laughs> at the same risk because it opens up the lungs. The second thing menthol does, which is interesting, menthol does something very similar to what uh, ammonia would do. Menthol helps your lungs get nicotine into your blood faster. Mm. The faster that nicotine into your blood, the faster it gets to your brain, the faster you're addicted. So menthol cigarettes, number one, they cool the smoke off, they inhale it deeper, have a higher risk of cancer, and they get it into your brain faster, so you're addicted faster. Mm. Oh, my God. This is powerful. Oh, my. I, I'm telling you, we got a lot of people listening right now online, um, a little over 300,000 people worldwide listening uh, to the, uh, our hero uh, at tonight, uh, the Honorable Dr. Victor DeNovo, Ph.D., former scientist of the world-renowned Philip Morris Research Center. We are discussing his 2011 documentary entitled Addiction Incorporated Inside the Darkness, only here uh, on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. Um, uh, the other ingredients um, that I heard, I, I don't know if this is true, uh, uh, Dr. DeNoble, that some of the other ingredients in a cigarette, uh, like uh, heavy metals, amen, uh, like uh, lead and mercury, and we talked about ammonia, uh, recycled tobacco, uh, for my, for if I'm I might be mis- mispronouncing this word uh, formaldehyde used to preserve dead bodies. I, it, 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 I mean, just I mean, um, it, do is are these ingredients still used in cigarettes? We're talking about uh, addiction here, uh, and you know, urea, which is found in urine, and arsenic, right. which is found in rat poison. That's in our cigarettes. Uh, is this true? Yes. What's uh, yes. interesting is it is true. Oh, it is true. It, it, if you look at what's in tobacco smoke, it's an array of formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, plutonium-210, cadmium. There's lead. There's actually nickel, mm. silver. There's, there's all the chemicals. However, if you analyze tobacco itself, there's only about mm. 300 chemicals in there. Now, the problem oh. is... When you light up a cigarette, that cigarette becomes a chemical factory. So when you're burning tobacco, you're forming over 4,000 chemicals that end up the person. Wow. Mm. So even though, mm. and what's interesting, you don't have to burn tobacco to get those chemicals. If you put spit tobacco mm. in your mouth, your saliva, will, because it's acidic, will actually break down the tobacco into the same 4,000 chemicals that you smoke a cigarette. That's why people who use spit tobacco get mouth cancer and throat cancer. Right. So those chemicals oh. aren't necessarily present or put into the tobacco product. Those chemicals are made when you use that tobacco product, when you burn it or you stick it in your oh mouth. And again, the same chemicals occur when you use an electronic cigarette, not to the same extent, but mm. they're there. And you're talking about formaldehyde. Is- it's used to preserve dead bodies. Are, are we talking about embalming fluid? That's exactly what it is, embalming fluid. Oh my there's, also, God. Uh, there's also propylene glycol, which is used in, in, in antifreeze. There's mm-hmm. also some uh, acids that are used in battery acids. Um, you have lead. Like I said, you have plutonium-210, which is, you, they use that to power nuclear submarines. All of that is being inhaled into your lungs. Oh, my God. This This is... Oh, uh, I, I'm telling you, uh, Dr. DeNoble, um, you're coming back for part two, three, four, and five, and we got to get you here to New York City for a major lecture okay. because we have, believe it or not, a lot of pastors um, uh-huh. that smoke. 
Uh, and this, yeah. this is, matter of fact, they're not supposed to be smoking anyway. There is, and, we're, and we have tonight with us, um, to me, a national hero, international hero, um, the Honorable Dr. Victor DeNoble, PhD, former scientist uh, for the Philip Morris Research Center, uh, and the creator of the 2011 blockbuster documentary entitled Addiction Incorporated Inside the Darkness, only here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. We'll get to some of your um, to our uh, listening audience, we'll get to maybe a few of your questions before um, we close out tonight. Continue to send in your questions to Global Spiritual Revolution Radio at yahoo.com. Again, beloved, that's Global Spiritual Revolution Radio at yahoo.com. Um, definitely, and we will send a lot of these questions to Dr. DeNoble if we can't get, to, and we, we, we definitely know we can't get to him tonight. Um, I'm telling you, th- th- this, this is amazing. There is a um, a, a form of LSD here in the African American community, and I want—I just wanted to get your take on it. And they call it that. Well, the street name is called Lucy, um, uh, which means, uh, which is another term for LSD, um, and it's called Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. That that's the street name for Lucy, um, which is nothing more than uh, LSD. Uh, in, in the form of of a blunt, um, and a lot the biggest ingredient in this Lucy uh, blunt is rat poison. And there have been some a lot of young African American men and women that have died in New York City, specifically in Harlem. Uh, there is a gigantic epidemic of this Lucy drug, and I believe uh, LSD is called, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, a lysergic. Asic, and I can't even pronounce the last name, diethylamide, something like that. But LSD, yes, uh, had, yeah, have you heard of this, this drug called Lucy, the street name? I, I've heard Lucy before, and I've heard, yeah, of course, I've heard LSD. Um, and wow. I know they're putting it in blunts. Uh, the problem with LSD is a couple of things. One is it's an acid, as you mentioned. And wow. acids don't really do well in your brain. A lot of drugs... They go into your brain, they'll come out of your brain, no problem. But when you have acids, it actually causes brain damage in the cell. So uh-huh. people who are using LSD, any type of acid compound in their brain, they're doing brain damage. The bottom mm-hmm. line is that uh, I think the rat poison is probably used in processing the LSD. And I am not sure of that. So I have to tell you, here's one of the things I say, I'm really not sure. I, I would yeah. guess that the rat poison is used as a, as a cooking agent to make the LSD to put into the blunt. Oh, um, my God. That's my suspicion. I do want to say one thing. I, I, I think it's important for people to understand smokers are not bad people. They are people who made a bad choice in their mm. personal life. And what, what we're doing mm. and what we, you and I are saying, we're not chastising people who smoke. My right. mom and dad are both smokers. My sister, <laughs> God bless. No, my whole three family members, you know, <laughs> died of smoking-related diseases. I love right. them to death. It's, 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 we're not chastising the smokers. We're not saying you, you did something wrong other than make a bad choice at 12 years old. We're chastising the tobacco industry that targeted those people at an age mm. where they couldn't make a good decision. Wow. I don't know if and, any other wow. industry – that targets people when they can't make good decisions. So mm. I think we need to make that clear. Smokers are people just like us who are probably sitting there going, I really wish I could quit. And guess what? It's not a choice for them. That would be like saying to a guy who's on heroin, you know something? Just stop using heroin. Come on, give me a break. <laughs> Nicotine is just as addictive as any other drug I know of. Yeah. These people have changed the way their brain works. And we have mm. to help them unchange. Hmm. And and my same uh, Nigerian uh, bishop friend, who I will name nameless tonight, said <laughs> that the tobacco industry here in the West uh, expects six a sixteen percent increase in tobacco use in Africa uh, to make up for the eight percent drop in consumption in Western Europe, which means that Africa is a global target of the Western tobacco industry. 
I find that frightening. Uh, we have with us Dr. Victor De Noble, a PhD, a man, um, national hero, international hero, an icon, a man, whistleblower, 1994, exposing not just the Philip Morris com- um, company uh, before um, the uh, Congress there in Washington, D.C., but also exposing the global tobacco industrial complex. In 2011, we are discussing his powerful documentary, Addiction um, Incorporated Inside the Darkness, only here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. And uh, and we're going to go deeper into his documentary right now. But before I do that, uh, uh, there was a stat, a telling stat, Uh, also by the CDC, that one pack of cigarettes in Africa uh, equals about three meals a day. And you're talking about children as far as as young as, what, 11 or 12 years old. That is frightening. All right, Dr. DeNovo, when you – okay, why did uh, Morris – Philip Morris let you go? And we know – well, we know, but uh, explain to our global audience, because you are a hero to us. Uh, explain to us why you were such a threat um, to uh, the Philip, Philip Morris um, Corporation. Yeah, it, well, you know, we started there, in, we started in 1980. And again, our yes. goal was to find a substitute for nicotine. And uh, lo and behold, we found that substitute in 1982. Um, but to find that substitute, we had to prove that nicotine was addictive. Mm. So here is a tobacco company in their walls, in their laboratories, having two scientists saying, we are proving nicotine is addictive. Now, what a little, hmm. most people don't know is that in 1982 in New Jersey, a lawsuit was filed by Rose Cipollon. Uh, she said, my husband died of smoking. Now, most of the lawsuits were all about cancer. This lawsuit in 1982 was the first one that said he was addicted nicotine. So all of a sudden, here you have the first lawsuit of its kind, and you have a laboratory inside a tobacco company saying, oh yeah, by the way, we proved it's addicting. So we (laughs) we had the smoking gun for the Mm. lawsuit. So the tobacco lawyers from Philip Morris said, oh my God, what are we going to do? We can't fire these guys because they've they've found a second drug. So we we, we want to have them, we want to exploit them with the second drug, so we can't fire him right away. And mm. we've got him suppressed, can't publish anything. So we'll wait until they tell us the second drug, which they did. And then in 1984, they called us and they said, hey, by the way, you fired. And we, we said, <laughs> oh, no reason, you just fired. Go downstairs, kill your animals, um, leave the building. So oh, we were my. fired because of a lawsuit that was filed in 1982. But like I said before, we were silenced. Paul and I both signed secrecy agreements. These are agreements that were lifelong agreements, that if we ever told anybody what we did, that, that not only could we be sued, but what we said would be sequestered by the courts. Mm. So we were silenced for 10 years until the congressional wow. hearing. Mm. Was your life ever threatened up until that point? Oh, since then? You know, I, I, when, when, when we were in protective custody, the FBI yeah. said there's a, probably about an 80 to 90% chance you're going to be killed. Oh, um, no. oh. so I, but but did, they, did they really threaten, you know, the tobacco industry is really super smart. They don't have to threaten you with guns. They have lawyers what? to do that. And, mm. and, and they did, you know, at what, in, in, in 19, let me think of it, 1985, after we were fired, we were fired in eighty four. In nineteen eighty five, we had called the tobacco company. We said, "Look, we'd like to publish some of the work here. We we think it's important for the scientific community to see what we did, to see right. and evaluate." And one of the lawyers, uh, I, I, I he had called me, and I, you know, I said, "Yeah." I said, "How you doing?" He said, "Fine." He goes, "Let me tell you something. If you publish that, he said, we're going to sue you. We're going to sue your family. Mm. We're going to sue everybody. We're going to make sure you never have a job for the rest of your life. We will bankrupt you." We will bankrupt everybody you know. We will make people so afraid of you that they won't even say hi to you. So we'll be uh-huh. threatened with our lives. Not really. We'll be threatened with our livelihoods and our freedom. Yes, we were. Wow. Man, this is – we got a few minutes, and we know you have to go, Dr. DeNoble. I, I've got it. 
another bishop friend out of uh, Shaker Heights, Ohio, uh, one of his church members um, uh-huh. is very, very high up in the Dollar General store. Now, I know Philip Morris, they also cover a lot of, um, they cover the food market as well. And maybe next time we can get into that. But he had said to me uh, that one of his members, one of his lay ministers, was, is, is still very high up uh, in the Dollar General uh, Corporation there out of uh, Shaker Heights, Ohio, which is a suburb of Cleveland. Uh-huh. And he stated that this young man has said that uh, there is a, a national conspiracy uh, by Dollar General that when they send their foods to their stores in the suburbs, okay, they send fresh meat, fresh vegetables, fresh food, organic, okay? Now, on the other side of the coin, when they send food into many of the urban areas, of not just Cleveland, Ohio, but throughout the United States of America, they don't send fresh organic food and fresh organic vegetables. They send tainted meat, poisonous cereals and BHT and uh, chemic, uh, you know, ch- ch- uh, you know, modified food, you know, uh, chemical, chemically modified food. And, and I, I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. You, this is sound like you're your conspiracy theorist. And I saw proof, which I probably I was not supposed to see, that there was. I don't know if it's still going on now, but the Dollar General store, just case in point, we're talking about Indiction Incorporated, that. Um, the urban, you talk about menthol in cigarettes uh, targeting the black community, that uh, many of the uh, uh, foods that have been contaminated with BHD, uh, uh, chemically modified uh, chemicals in cereals and milk uh, that are also addictive, targeting uh, those who live in urban areas. This, uh, uh, man, I got this is this is frightening. Uh, what say you about it? It's very scary. I, I have to be honest with you. I I, I can't comment because I don't know. I, I haven't seen the data. Um, yeah. I, it it kind of wouldn't surprise me. I mean, again, I'm not targeting you know Dollar General, but but it no, wouldn't no. surprise me that some of these practices actually go on. Uh, you know, you know, we we all know that that there are niches and targets that people that companies go to, um, but it. it I, Honestly, uh, Bishop, I, I, it, it's hard for me to comment on that one because I just, I just don't know. And by the way, yeah. I love saying that when I just don't know something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, me too. When I'm speaking at a conference or at a church, and if there's a question that uh, someone asks me, if I don't know, I don't make up, uh, you make up an answer. But this, this is powerful. Um, any, any closing comments, um, Dr. DeNoble? I, I, I. I'm telling you, and I do apologize to our listening audience that um, we didn't have enough time. Maybe we're going to send the questions to Dr. DeNoble. And Dr. DeNoble, uh, any closing remarks here? Uh, what, is, what is the message, especially to young people, when it comes to the dangers of cigarettes? Well, you know, drugs change your brain, and, and, and they do it. It's a process. This is what's amazing about drug addiction. Yeah. Nobody knows they're getting addicted to a drug. You don't know right. when you've learned when you don't know when you're learning something, but you know when you've learned it. So your brain can't tell you it's it, it, it's changed. It, it, hmm. It's changing. It can only tell you it's changed. So a person using a drug, they they can't feel their brain being slowly changed. And at one point, they're going, like, "Oh my gosh, I'm addicted." So addiction right. is something that creeps up on you that you don't know is happening, and that that's not only with all other drugs, but with tobacco as well. So, you know, drug addiction is a brain change that you're not going to feel happening. You're only going to feel when it's done. So mm-hmm. and you never know what's going to be done. So I think this, we have to think of, of drug addiction as a brain disease. Wow. Wow. And, 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 and so, wow. Wow. And, and uh, man of God, I'm telling you, thank you so much, Dr. DeNoble, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us here uh, tonight on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. No, thank you, Bishop Gates, for what you do. You reach, you reach tons and tons of people, and that's really important. I'm only one person, and you're a person who's got a voice, and you've got a message, and God bless you for what you do. 
I love you, man of God. And we got to get you here to New York City. And um, a lot of questions coming in. And what does RICO mean? Well, RICO simply means the Racketeer Influence in Corrupt uh, Organizations Act, commonly referred to as RICO, the RICO Act. All right. And so um, that was Dr. Um, Victor DeNovo, PhD, former scientist of the world-renowned Philip Morris Research Center here in the United States of America, and also the creator of one of the most powerful documentaries uh, entitled Addiction Incorporated Inside the Darkness, only here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. And I want to leave this to our listening audience scripturally in Matthew uh, 9 and 12. Jesus Christ declared, they that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. Uh, It's very interesting that in the Coptic interpretation of that scripture, um, the term uh, sick comes from the Coptic word palenik, which is capital P-A-L-E-N-Q-U-E, which means addicted. So Jesus was actually saying, they that be unaddicted need not a physician, but they that are addicted. Um, that was uh, Addiction Incorporated, Inside the Darkness. Again, uh, Dr. Denoble, uh, we want you to come back for part two of this. And you open my eyes, and we love you here. We honor you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much uh, for being with us tonight, in Jesus' name. Thank you. I appreciate it. God bless. God bless you. And that was um, the Honorable Dr. Victor DeNovo. Uh, he is a world-renowned uh, lecturer, teacher, and we're going to get him to come to New York City and also Long Island sometime in the future. And we're going to make a clarion call to a lot of young people because there are so many young people um, that are experiencing sicknesses and diseases, and it is not the perfect will of God for us to even uh, touch that that poison called cigarettes. So again, that was Dr. Victor DeNoble, uh, former scientist of the world-renowned Philip Morris Research Center uh, and the creator of the Blockbuster. And I'm telling all of your our Global Spiritual Revolution partners, if you want to purchase the DVD of this powerful documentary, Addiction Incorporated, Inside the Darkness, go to addictionincorporated.com. Again, addictionincorporated.com. And you can purchase this powerful 2011 documentary uh, exposing the American tobacco industrial complex, not just here in the United States, but around the world. And also you can go to Dr. DeNoble's website of victordenoble.com, victordenoble.com. And to all of our pastors, If you want this great man of God to come to your church, give him an email. Go to Victor D. Noble, that's V-I-C-T-O-R-D-E-N-O-B-L-E.com, VictorDenoble.com. Send him a message on his website. He will get back to you. And I guarantee you, pastors and teachers and parents, mothers and fathers, you, your life will never be the same again after hearing this great man of God. We will see you next time here uh, tomorrow night on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio, where we will have another guest here, and for we are raising the consciousness of mankind to become the consciousness of Jesus Christ. Good night from Global Spiritual Revolution uh, Media through Global Spiritual Revolution Radio out of Long Island, New York. God bless you in Jesus' name. We see you next time.